Welcome to part three of American Carnage's five-part series on John Brown. This episode is titled, The Stifled Wails of Widows. The incident we're going to talk about today is, I think it's safe to say, the single most controversial event in John Brown's entire life. Nothing else he does has provoked more bitter and endless debate among historians. And I include in that assessment the raid on Harper's Ferry that sparks the civil war that Brown is most known for. We're going to cover that in the next two episodes. But this one is devoted to this other incident, this incident that even John Brown's staunchest defenders will sometimes struggle and have trouble justifying because this event is going to put them on the defensive from the moment it happens and through the subsequent 170 years and up to the present day. I'm going to try really hard and be very clear that I don't want to weigh in either way on whether I think this event was justified or not. I'm going to do my best to give you the facts, and let you uh, hear the dueling interpretations and make up your own mind for yourself. But I want to say that if you want to believe in the good of John Brown, if you want to see him as a noble soldier, the hardest thing to wrestle with will be the events in this episode. And, you know, as I said in the first episode in our introduction, I've read at this point more than 15 books on John Brown. uh, And I went through all these books as I was preparing this episode, and I counted which historians and how many of them seem to justify and be okay with the actions that Brown commits here, and how many of them either look askance on it or criticize it or outright condemn it as morally indefensible. And that rough count, you know, not an exact science, but my rough estimate from doing that exercise suggests that The majority of John Brown historians, even the contemporary ones, really, I would say probably more than 75%, really look askance and criticize what Brown does here and have trouble justifying it, even when they're sympathetic to Brown's larger aims. But before we get to what Brown does, I want to give you a rundown because I think it's really important to understand what is going on in his head at this point. You know, what are the motives for the actions that he takes that are so hotly debated? Because remember, as we discussed at the end of episode two, in 1856, around the time that this all happens, Brown is infuriated by the cowardice, and I think it is fair to call it cowardice, of the free state leaders who refuse to defend the free state side in the Kansas conflict and are being trounced by the border ruffians who have trampled the elections and sacked their major city, the city of Lawrence. And then as that's happening, right around the same time that the city of Lawrence, this free state stronghold is being sacked, in Washington back east, there's going to be an event that many of you no doubt are familiar with, but that has incredible resonance for this story because there's this Massachusetts senator named Charles Sumner, and he will give this incredibly long speech over basically two days. And Sumner's speech really recounts all the events that we talked about in episode two. Sumner's address will be titled The Crime Against Kansas, and he will go over all the outrages committed by the pro-slavery side, the electoral fraud, the sacking of Lawrence that we chronicled. And in response to this speech, which also insinuates quite strongly that specific Southern slaveholders raped their slaves, Sumner, while he's signing uh, copies of the speech, which is going to essentially be nationally syndicated, as he's sitting in his seat in the Senate chambers signing copies of this speech, he will suddenly be struck from behind by a South Carolina congressman named Preston Brooks, who is wielding his cane and using it to bash Sumner's head over and over again until the cane itself shatters. Sumner is actually at this point trapped at his desk, which is bolted to the floor, which is why he can't get up. And the force of the cane will knock him unconscious, and he will almost bleed to death right there on the floor of the Senate chamber. 
And so if we are trying to build a model of what is going through John Brown's mind, because news of this event will reach Kansas pretty quickly afterwards. So putting together what's going on in Brown's head, element number one, right, is the sacking of Lawrence unimpeded without any defense from the Free Staters. Element number two is going to be the caning of this senator who dared defy the slave powers in the halls of Congress. And then there is element number three, which I think it's safe to say is the thing that Brown's defenders in this controversy will cite the most. Because element number three here is that Brown has specific and credible evidence that he and his sons face a legitimate and imminent threat of violence. Remember that in Kansas at this point, we're almost heading towards an open civil war in this territory. At this point, six free state settlers have already been killed by the pro-slavery border ruffians, and a sort of kangaroo court on the pro-slavery side has issued warrants for the arrests of several of Brown's sons. So there's this moment, this scene that I love, it kind of reminds me of like some of the scenes in Hamlet where Hamlet is trying to get confirmation of um, the fact that his father was murdered by his uncle. And what Brown will do is that he and his boys will disguise themselves as land surveyors. I don't know what the land surveyor uh, disguise or uniform exactly look like, but they will pretend to be these federal officials just there to look at the land and get a, a lay of it. They will sneak into the border ruffian camp dressed as these officials and, you know, become friends with them and start making conversation with them. And at this point, one of the ruffians who doesn't know that these are the abolitionists that they're so riled up about, one of these ruffians will tell Brown and his family that they have plans to, quote, unquote, annihilate the Browns and his abolitionist sons. So that's element number three, right? One, the sacking of Lawrence without anything done in its defense. Two, Sumner being caned without anything done in his defense. And three, this, you know, what some historians will say is credible and imminent threat that Brown and his sons are at risk of being um, attacked, you know, any day now by the pro-slavery border ruffians, who, again, remember, have already killed six or so anti-slavery settlers. And so when Brown and his boys get back from this, you know, expedition where they've been pretending to be land surveyors, Brown is just livid. He will tell his men, quote, We have got to defend our families and our neighbors as best we can. Something is going to be done now. We must show by actual work that there are two sides to this thing and that they cannot keep going on with impunity, end quote. So Brown will round up a group of men and they will hit the road. This band will include Brown's sons, Owen, Frederick, Salmon, and Oliver, his son-in-law, Henry Thompson, who his, one of his daughters met in North Elba. And then my, I have to admit, frankly, as a Stein, my favorite character in the whole bunch, uh, Theodore Weiner, a 37-year-old Jewish immigrant who reportedly weighed like 250 pounds and primarily spoke Yiddish. This was an interesting twist in the historical record uh, for a Jew of Eastern European descent that I love to see. But one of the people who does not join on this expedition is going to be Brown's oldest son, John Jr. And just quickly, I think it's worth stressing, John Jr. has been up until this point really the apple of his father's eye. He's been elected to the Topeka legislature and given a prominent role. He is described as warm and intelligent and is a passionate abolitionist who becomes very close friends and supporters with the native peoples living in Kansas. John Jr. will go to his father and say, please, quote, do nothing rash. Brown will brush off his son and ignore him, and he and his men will hit the road and then sneak in the darkness along the Potawatomi Creek, which is why this moment is going to be known forever to history as the Potawatomi Massacre. And as far as I can tell, despite all the dueling interpretations about what this event meant and whether it was justified, the simple facts, the following facts of the story are not really in dispute. Brown's men will be carrying these heavy broadswords. Uh, if you can Google a photo, they're definitely worth looking at if you have time. Brown picked them up in Akron, Ohio, on his way to the Kansas Prairie the year earlier. I went with my wife uh, to Harper's Ferry a little over a year ago, and they actually have one of the swords that Brown's men wielded. They have that at the museum at Harper's Ferry. They don't tell you whose it was. But I really like the way that uh, the historian Louis DeCaro Jr. describes them in his biography of Brown, quote, the fire from the mist of you. DeCaro writes of these swords, quote, 
The short broadswords were straight and double-edged and honed to sharpness prior to the attack. Designed for cuts rather than thrusts, the weapons were hollow and loaded with quicksilver. When held upright, the quicksilver dropped to the hilt, but slid upwards to the point in striking motion so as to increase the force of the blow, end quote. Brown's raiders will travel by moonlight as they sneak along the creek. The first house they get to belongs to uh, a man by the name of James Doyle. Well, I just told you, right, that there is not a ton of dispute about the facts of what's about to happen. What is remarkable to me is that you can read like six different biographies of John Brown and get six completely different interpretations about who this guy was and what he represented. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Just to stick to the facts we can all agree to, Brown and his men will approach this cabin in the woods. They're first uh, attacked by a guard dog, which they quickly dispatch with one of the broadswords. Brown's men then go up to the door. They knock on it, waking up the Doyles. When James Doyle opens the door, the men immediately barge inside. They hold him and his family at gunpoint. Brown's men uh, move to take Doyle and his two oldest sons outside. Doyle's wife, Mahala, will burst into tears and beg the men not to take their third son, who is a 16-year-old boy. Brown agrees to not take that boy. Brown's gang then leads the prisoners out into the woods behind the cabin where they meet the other members of the raiding party. They then execute the Doyles, hacking and slashing away at the father and his two sons with these heavy broadswords, leaving behind only a pile of limbs. At some point, Brown will fire a single shot into James Doyle's skull, and we'll get into this in a second, but remarkably, and this blows my mind, but remarkably, there are still to this day, 170 years later, arguments among historians about whether Doyle was alive or not at the time that this shot was fired, but we'll get back to that in a second. These killings are unequivocally grisly. The Kansas historian Nicole Etchinson would write of the killings, quote, all the Potawatomi victims would bear the marks of death by sword, displaying the gashes and severed fingers, arms, and hands that resulted when victims such as the young Doyles threw up their arms to protect themselves, end quote. With James Doyle and his two eldest sons dead, Brown's men then move onto the farm owned by um, a guy named Alan Wilkinson. He is the pro-slavery district attorney in the territory of Kansas. Again, they bang on the door Wilkinson will answer in his pajamas. Brown's men will tell him the dress and shove him outside before he can put his boots on. Brown's men then go about hacking Wilkinson to death and dumping his body in the woods. This time it seems like Brown's son-in-law Thompson and the Jewish immigrant Wiener play the leading roles in actually carving this guy up. Brown's raiders will then cross the Potawatomi Creek in search of a notorious pro-slavery outlaw named Dutch Henry Sherman, Sherman, however, is away for the night, and so Brown and his men grab this guy's brother, a guy named Bill Sherman, and force him out onto the creek as well. The next morning, Bill Sherman is found with his skull split in two places. His brains are, quote, oozing out into a nearby creek, to use the verb chosen by the historian David Reynolds. Sherman has a hole cut through his breast, and his left hand is severed off entirely with the exception of a little bit of skin dangling from one of, where one of his uh, fingers is supposed to be. Brown and his men then head back to the Potawatomi Creek, where we get this image of them dipping their swords, these broad swords, in the water to wash them of the blood. And so Brown has orchestrated this shocking, sudden killing of five men, James Doyle and his two sons, the district attorney Wilkinson, and lastly, this guy, Bill Sherman, the brother of the guy that they were initially looking for. This basic set of facts I've just described really does not seem in dispute even by Brown's most ardent defenders. But right away, and I mean days within the killing, in the aftermath of the killing, we get what emerge as the case for and the case against Brown having done this. And as I said, historians have been debating it ever since. Some of the older history books, like the Robert Penn Warren book that I alluded to in episode one, they will make a lot of the fact that Brown and his men ransacked these guys' homes and stole their horses and then later resold the horses for an unknown amount. And people like uh, Hill Peebles Wilson, who I told you about in episode two, the anti-slavery guy who really doesn't like Brown, they will argue essentially that this was 
really an act of robbery, that Brown was looking to take some money, take some goods and supplies, and the killings are maybe even kind of incidental. Given Brown's uh, stated willingness to do extraordinary things on behalf of the abolitionist cause over a decade before this event even transpires, I don't think that theory makes a lot of sense. And frankly, most of the historians I really trust regard that as complete rubbish. So I think we should set it aside. But if this wasn't a simple act of robbery and instead something of a political killing, which I think the evidence suggests that at least it was in part, then I think there are some questions that are genuinely hard for Brown and his defenders to answer. I mean, for instance, if Brown is killing people in the middle of the night because he's so committed to the cause of abolitionism and ending the scourge of slavery, then why does he kill five people who, by all accounts that I've read at least, never themselves own slaves? And then there's, of course, the other obvious question, which is, you know, how brave is it really to hack to bits five people that you wake up in the middle of the night who are, you know, what Brown's critics will say are essentially helpless victims? I mean, if killing these guys is so vital and so important in the cause of abolitionism, then why does not a single slave get freed by what Brown does here? And Brown himself, in my opinion, doesn't really help his case that much because his defenses and his explanations for his own actions will be sort of legalistic and they'll shift a lot. I mean, at first he'll say he had nothing to do with this. Then he'll say, you know, maybe he had something to do with it, but, you know, he wasn't personally responsible for doing the actual murders, which seems, you know, maybe like a cop out if he was there and leading this band and they committed the murders and he was just there for them. That doesn't seem like much of a defense to me. And then later, Brown will say, you know, that they were necessary and that he was involved, but that they were, you know, absolutely essential. So then there's that defense. And many historians, I think it's fair to say, are not convinced. You read the historian Tony Horowitz's book, Midnight Rising, and he sounds quite skeptical of all the defenses offered. I know just as a warning for the next section, it's going to seem like a lot of weirdly technical and specific detail, but I think it's absolutely actually really important for understanding how we evaluate John Brown's actions here. So just bear with me for a second, because Brown's defenders will say after this that he fired a bullet into Doyle's head after Doyle was already dead as a way to sort of send the signal to the rest of the Raiders that, you know, it was time to move on from this event, from this killing. And this is part of how the Browns eventually argue that their dad was not directly involved in the butchery since Doyle was already dead at the time that Brown fired what is referred to as, you know, the signal shot, meaning to give the signal for everyone to leave. And what Brown's defenders will also say is that they they had to use these grisly broadswords that we've been talking about and that leave all these horrific gashes and wounds because to use guns would have proven too loud and woken up their neighbors so they had no choice. And yet Horowitz, like any good critical historian, I think raises some really difficult questions about this account. Horowitz writes in his book, quote, Among Brown's defenders, this has become the accepted explanation of Doyle's bullet wound, but it made little sense. If a signal shot was all Brown intended, he could have fired in the air instead of shooting a dead man in the face. Other statements in Brown's defense were likewise dubious. Broadswords, it was claimed, had been used for the sake of quiet, not with intent to mutilate. But if Brown wanted to avoid raising the alarm, why did witnesses report hearing gunshots, including the one that left a bullet in Doyle's forehead? End quote. And so this historian, uh, Horowitz, is really questioning the idea that John Brown shot Doyle after he was essentially already dead. And yet other historians, and again, I know this is such a digression into a seemingly narrow question, but Stick with me for a second, because the other historians, including this guy, Louis DeCaro Jr., will be absolutely furious at what Horowitz suggests. And DeCaro will say that what Horowitz argues about this killing is all rubbish and all wrong and just totally misses what occurred. And what DeCaro will say is that, and remember, these two are contemporary historians writing essentially in the present day. DeCaro will, will say that basically, no, that the historical record does suggest that Brown shot this guy after he was already dead. DeCaro writes, quote, and in the following quote, Tony means Tony Horowitz, quote, Tony infers things about the Potawatomi killings that are untenable, but which serve the worst image of Brown in Kansas. Most notably, he claims that Brown personally killed James Doyle, one of his inimical neighbors, by shooting him in the forehead. To the contrary, 
the primary sources and logical analysis of the incident call for the conclusion that Brown shot Doyle's corpse at the conclusion of the deadly raid. Tony likewise infers that the five men killed at Potawatomi were deliberately mutilated by Brown and his men, yet he overlooks the obvious fact that their severed arms and hands were defense wounds and that the men were essentially executed, not deliberately maimed, mutilated, or otherwise tortured, end quote. And I have to say, maybe like you, when I first came across this debate, I was thinking, like, who cares? I mean, why does it matter whether Brown shot Doyle when the guy was already dead or a few minutes earlier? I mean, I'm sure Doyle himself doesn't have that firm of a view on the matter. But I actually think this seemingly small uh, dispute among historians really actually does matter because it gets at this broader argument that DeCaro and the Brown defenders will make, which is that... Everything Brown does here, every act of violence is endlessly hyped and focused on and dramatically overstated and and in a way that has completely lost sight of the importance of what Brown was actually doing. If this is a trial, right, and the historian Horowitz is prosecuting Brown for crimes against the state, then what DeCaro and other Brown attorneys will argue is that this is essentially a critical act of self-defense committed in as quick and painless a way as possible under the circumstances. That's why this debate, swords or guns, becomes important. But that they'll say that anyone who wants to go around accusing Brown of terrorism here is simply fundamentally misunderstanding what was happening, right? The Doyles were not slave owners, but they had been plantation patrols on Southern plantations. And they had been, right, going around making credible threats to slit the throats of abolitionists in the area. I mean, maybe you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because threats of violence are so rampant at this part, but there's no doubt that all five of the men who were executed are part of the pro-slavery border ruffian side. And really the core thing that historians like DeCaro, who defend Brown, will stress is that Brown had already confirmed with his men that an active and credible violent threat was imminent. And remember, the anti-slavery side is outgunned and outmanned in basically every feasible way to stop the pending massacre of their settlers. And that Brown was justified and had every reason to say, after all the violence that the South is inflicting, you know, from the halls of Congress to Lawrence on the anti-slavery side, that it's time to do a little bit of the reverse. Again, remember the stakes here. We are talking about the potential for Kansas to enter the Union as a slave state in a way that will potentially shift the balance of power within Congress in a way that will enable America to become a vast slave empire across two continents. And so the question becomes, the uncomfortable, I think, question becomes, what potential responses to that are justified? I mean, slavery already at this point is entrapped 4 million people and subjecting them routinely to all kinds of violence, right? Rapes, beatings, uh, unimaginable forms of abuse. Brown's critics will say with good reason that Brown here is killing five civilians who are not, you know, the heads of the biggest plantations by any stretch of the imagination. And what Brown's allies will say in response is that he believed, you know, I actually would go further here myself and say not that Brown believed, but that what he accurately and actually in fact saw was that violence was already ongoing, was already raging, and that slavery already represented essentially a Holocaust-level event that was no less violent simply because it was legal and endorsed by the U.S. government. And so I think this, above all else, becomes the core pillar of the defense of Brown's killings at Potawatomi. Osborne Anderson, uh, a black raider who had joined Brown at Harper's Ferry, we're going to talk about him a lot in episodes four and five. Anderson sums up this idea very well. He writes, quote, Brown regarded slavery as a state of perpetual war against the slave, end quote. And so viewed in this light, you can see Brown as killing, you know, a handful of people who supported this institution of slavery as being themselves willing participants as part of this war that these civilians had, in fact, entered this kind of battlefield as enemy combatants, regardless of the idea that or the fact that the U.S. government regarded them as civilians because they were adhering to the law that allowed slavery to exist. In particular, a lot of black intellectuals in the decades after Harper's Ferry will really harp on this point and emphasize this point, which is that for all of the historical ink shed over Brown's killings at Potawatomi, and there is a ton of it, 
bemoaning what he does here. How can you look at the deaths of five white men in isolation? How can you talk about their deaths without recognizing that literally millions of enslaved black people are being subjected to all kinds of violence routinely that far dwarfs what Brown did in the Potawatomi? I'm paraphrasing here, but you read Malcolm X or James Baldwin, and they'll say, you know, how are these white historians upset, so upset, really, about this instead of all of the the violence being perpetrated on black people. And so in this light, the Potawatomi massacre begins to be seen by many people as an important act of racial solidarity. And not just, I should add, with black Americans. Um, there's this fascinating thing. I apologize. I have not had time to get into. There's just so much ground and material we have to cover here. But one thing the historian David Reynolds will note that I found really interesting and had no idea of before this project is that Brown, throughout his life, had very close relations, not just with black Americans, but also with the American Indians, both as a young man in Ohio, but also when he gets to Kansas and other parts of his life. Tribes such as the Sacks and the Foxes and the Ottawa all developed very close ties with the men at Brown stations. They traded back and forth and developed, by all accounts, a genuine friendship. And what Reynolds writes, and this really, again, surprised me when I saw it, is that Brown is closely in touch with these American Indians ahead of the Potawatomi massacre. These tribal groups also really hated the white pro-slavery settlers who had launched a particularly vindictive campaign of expropriating native lands, as, you know, Europeans had done since landing in the Americas, of course. And what I found fascinating in Reynolds' book is that he suggests that Brown's Potawatomi massacre should be properly thought of as consciously attempting to replicate the kinds of violence that both the slaves and the American Indians committed in response to their oppressors, with the incredibly novel twist, right, that it's being carried out by a white man and his white followers and, you know, the one Jewish guy. After these events, Brown will be compared a lot to Nat Turner, who is as I'm sure many of you know, the black slave who killed a few dozen white people as part of a slave insurrection. But Reynolds says that it's no coincidence that Brown's raid both looks like Nat Turner's rebellion in some respects and also replicates elements of the traditional Indian scalping that I'm sure you're familiar with from Westerns and, and the like. Reynolds will write of the Potawatomi massacre, quote, The murders were related to such atrocities as Nat Turner's nocturnal rampage or the scalping raids of Indians. John Brown not only wanted to kill pro-slavery people, he wanted to do it in a way that insurrectionary slaves or embittered Indians would have done it. His acts of violence surged from the heart of racial oppression. Like his later revolutionary schemes, Potawatomi stemmed from Brown's racially motivated vindictiveness. He was defending the rights of not only African Americans, but also of Native Americans, end quote. And yet, as true as that all might be, not even Brown's most loyal allies will be fully comfortable with the Potawatomi massacre or its implications, especially not at the outset. And that includes his kids. Brown, remember, has this remarkably tight-knit family, bound by religion, yes, but primarily by a deep, shared commitment to radical anti-slavery political action. They've moved all over the country, facing poverty and sickness and death and overwhelming adversity, and yet... Despite the intensity of that bond, the fallout from the Potawatomi massacre is going to nearly shatter them. Remember that Brown's oldest son, John Jr., chose not to participate in the attack, and neither does his second eldest son, the sensitive, pacifistic Jason Brown. And actually, right before John Brown does this, John Brown Jr., who, as I may have said, is at this point the commander of a group of anti-slavery settlers, John Brown Jr. will liberate a slave from somewhere further in the East. John Brown Jr. is criticized by his own men in this troop for doing so. Remember, many of the anti-slavery whites were against slavery because they wanted to keep Kansas free of blacks of any kind, slave or free. And to them, Brown Jr. liberating this uh, black person is a total waste of time. So Brown Jr. is not exactly a coward. And yet he is going to be rapidly unmoored by what we've been discussing. When John Brown returns to his camp after the deed is done, the pacifistic son Jason will confront him, trembling. Did you have anything to do with the killing of those men on the Potawatomi? Jason asks. I did not do it, Brown responds, but I approved of it. Jason Brown then goes to his other brother, Frederick, who participated in the massacre. 
Jason will ask his wild-haired brother if he knows who murdered the men on the Potawatomi. Frederick, with tears streaming down his face, will nod and tell his brother, quote, Yes, I do, but I can't tell you, end quote. These two eldest sons, John Jr. and Jason, will soon leave their father's side. They find shelter with a family, but will soon have to leave again because word will fast spread throughout the territory that the Brown family is responsible for these grisly murders. While on the road, Jason will surrender to a passing militia, thinking that perhaps because he played no role in the massacre, he can appeal to their mercy. John Jr., whose mental state has gradually deteriorated, is also captured by the same militia after initially trying to escape into the forest. This eldest son, John Jr., who's already fragile, will be chained to a tent pole, and the border ruffians will take turns beating him with their rifle butts. Jason, John, and two other free state prisoners of these border ruffians will then be chained together and forced to march east on foot at a rate of about 25 miles per day. John Jr.'s wrists and upper arms are bound tightly behind him, so tightly, in fact, that by the time they reach the camp, His arms are so swollen and covered with so much blood that the thick rope around his body can no longer be seen. John Jr., this eldest son, his grasp on reality will soon begin to deteriorate as he dwells on the murders at Potawatomi. He will, for some reason, think that he is the commander of the border ruffian camp and will start barking orders at the Missouri men who have imprisoned him. The Southerners will order Jason, the second oldest son, to keep his brother quiet. And Jason will reply, quote, I cannot keep an insane man still. The ruffians then just decide to beat John Jr. until he is knocked unconscious. Over the next several days, as this ordeal repeats itself, the brothers are forced to march over 65 miles. Eventually, Jason Brown is released from custody, but John Brown Jr., who is again losing touch with reality, will be charged with high treason for his role in the Free State Topeka Legislature and imprisoned along with the Governor Charles Robinson, who we met in Episode 2. But as this is happening, I think we get to maybe the most crucial defense of the Potawatomi Massacre that people will make, which is that after they occur, the entire tenor, the entire complexion of the conflict in Kansas begins to really shift. And I would argue that not only the conflict in Kansas, but the conflict over slavery in America overall marks a tremendous change from the moment that Brown and his men draw their broadswords. Because remember that for nearly 300 years, the slaveholders have been accustomed to having essentially a monopoly on violence. And now suddenly, really again, for the first time outside the slave insurrections themselves, behind every abolitionist pamphlet, Embedded in the pronouncements of every man skeptical of slavery, Southern slaveholders begin seeing John Brown and his raiders sneaking through the woods in the middle of the night, their broadswords ready to draw blood. One Kansan who lived through this period will later write, quote, The news of the hard affair, meaning the Potawatomi Massacre, spread rapidly over the territory, carrying with it a thrill of horror such as the people had not felt before. Hitherto, in most cases ending in homicide or murder, the free state men had proven the victim. The news of the event had a deeper significance than appeared in the abstract atrocity itself. It meant that the policy of extermination and abject submission, so blatantly promulgated by the pro-slavery press and proclaimed by the pro-slavery speakers, had been adopted by their enemies— It meant that there was a power opposed to the pro-slavery aggressors as cruel and unrelenting as themselves, end quote. And I know we talked about in episode two sort of the psychological impact of the scariness of the border ruffians, right? And what's going to happen now really is the opposite of that. The anti-slavery side finally have a psychological edge. Right after the killings, Brown and his men will flee to the woods where they'll hide Brown and his men will run for Brown Station. They'll make a break for it. This is the uh, settlement that Brown and his son started. And they'll find that their entire property has been burned to the ground by the ruffians. Making matters worse, President Franklin Pierce will dispatch federal marshals to get Brown and his men. 
It will be tracked the entire summer. And yet, despite his family being really broken by this, Brown's sons will be taken into federal custody. And despite the fact that they're now on the run, what happens is crucial here because the anti-slavery men finally decide to join Brown in resisting the slave power. A few weeks after the massacre at Potawatomi, Brown will get word of a border ruffian force encamped near Blackjack, which is a site just a few miles outside the Kansas uh, town of Prairie City. And Brown at this point will have about nine men under his command. And the pro-slavery side, which is actually being led by a UVA dropout named Henry Clay Pate, they have at least 55 men, so almost twice as many men on their side. And again, remember the psychological impact I've been describing here. One of the things that happens after Brown's massacre is that the South is so determined to make these killings out to be the murders of the century, right, that they exaggerate dramatically what's happened. And maybe that's good for propaganda reasons to make the abolitionist murderers look worse. But you get these accounts of anti-slavery abolitionists murdering scores of Southern boys. I mean, obviously, that's not what happened, but that takes off in the Southern imagination. And because it does, it contributes to this idea that Brown actually is this really vicious, fierce killer, which, you know, he is somewhat, but not the way that he gets portrayed as this totalizing uh, monster that is really powerful in the Southern imagination. And that begins to have a, that psychological impact begins to have a real impact on the battlefield itself. So remember, Brown is outnumbered almost two to one when he gets to Blackjack. Um, He links up with, you know, I told you about that Jewish immigrant, Theodor Weiner. Weiner has a business partner. He's a 22-year-old Jewish immigrant by the name of August Bondi. Bondi uh, joins Brown and his men, and they ride to Blackjack. They get there at about four in the morning. The watchman for Pate, this border ruffian commander, they will see Brown's men, and they'll hurry back to their captain uh, with the news. But Brown's forces will catch a crucial break here. The watchmen tell Pate that Brown has more than 100 men at his command instead of the reality, which is, again, closer to a third of that number. At about uh, 6 a.m., after around an hour or two of sleep, Brown will tell his men to dismount and march on Pate's camp. He will order Frederick Brown, this wild-looking son with the long hair, to wait behind with the horses. The ruffians see Brown's men from about 200 feet away, and they open fire. Brown will corral his men into a dry riverbed that snakes around the right side of Pate's camp. Pate's men will take cover in a similar ravine on the left side of the camp. These two sides will trade fire in these positions all day for more than 12 hours. As the fighting intensifies, all but one of the men in the militia that join Brown deserts the camp. So Brown is now down to maybe about a dozen men advancing on Pate's forces with about five times that number. Around this point, Henry Thompson, Brown's son-in-law, who was present at Potawatomi, will be shot and killed. August Bundy, the young Jewish immigrant, will later write in his memoirs, these (laughs) memoirs that I really loved, Bundy will write that he and this hefty Jewish partner of his, Theodore Weiner, will literally speak to each other in Yiddish as they advance in this dry river bend towards the border ruffians. Bondi writes, quote, We followed Captain Brown up the hill towards the border ruffian camp. I next to Brown and in advance of Wiener, we walked with our bent backs, nearly crawled, that the tall dead grass of the year before might somewhat hide us from the border ruffian marksmen, and yet the bullets kept on whizzing. Wiener puffed like a steamboat, hurrying behind me. I called out to him in Yiddish, well, what do you make of it now? His answer was, well, what should I think of it? In spite of the whistling bullets, I laughed when he said, look out or we'll make the old man, meaning John Brown, angry, end quote. Brown at this point will order his men to start shooting at the horses and the mules in Pate's camp. And when that happens, Brown's wild son, Frederick, no longer feels like he can stay with the horses at a safe distance. Frederick will jump on the horse uh, owned by his brother Owen Brown. This horse is called Red Ned Scarlet. Frederick will gallop across the battlefield directly into heavy gunfire, brandishing one of the swords that they used at Potawatomi. And he will shout at this point that basically they have the Pate forces surrounded and cut off all their communication. 
Somehow Frederick will avoid being struck by the whizzing bullets, and yet this bizarre attack will unnerve the southern border ruffian commander, who will later say that he incorrectly assumed that Frederick was at the vanguard of a massive cavalry charge rushing into the ravine. Pate will send out the white truce flag of surrender, and Brown and his tiny little force will arrest this much bigger army of border ruffians. Remember, again, the psychological impact of Potawatomi, that now the ruffians are afraid, really for the first time, that the anti-slavery settlers can also resort to violence. This is going to be a tremendous public relations victory for Brown. He and his men not only take captive many of Pate's men, but they take guns and ammo and wagons and horses and livestock. This battle of blackjack proved that Brown is not just someone who can only kill people in the dead of night who are sleeping, but he can actually take the fight to a force of border ruffians. And throughout this summer, as the violence in the Kansas Territory steadily increases, so too does Brown's legend. In the immediate aftermath of Potawatomi, the anti-slavery leaders fiercely denounced the killings and sought to put distance between themselves and Brown. But as the whole territory devolves into essentially open warfare, Brown is going to start looking more and more to the anti-slavery politicians even as a prescient hero. Everywhere Brown goes, he's going to start being greeted by cheering crowds. Wealthy abolitionists back east will raise money for him and buy guns and ammo to send his way. As his legend grows among the free state side, so too does it grow in the south. And as I said, the South is going to latch onto Brown as a boogeyman because it's convenient to associate everything the Free Staters do with the butcher of Potawatomi. But in doing so, they also inadvertently burnish his status. Southern newspapers will start giving Brown credit for all manner of fighting by the anti-slavery side, often where he has absolutely nothing to do with it. Pro-slavery meetings will be broken up by rumors that Brown is in the area when he's not even close to them. David Reynolds will write, quote, it was the idea of John Brown that terrorized the South. He was a new phenomenon, an abolitionist who was committed to armed warfare against slavery and who showed no signs of relenting, end quote. This book by this Jewish immigrant, August Bondi, will tell of many other raids led by Brown and his men in the summer of 1856 in Kansas. At one point, Bondi will write of an attack on a pro-slavery force of roughly 500 men. This force is called the Bourbon County Rangers, and they march under this red skull and crossbones flag. Much as in the Battle of Blackjack, Brown's force is significantly smaller, maybe about 100 men to the 500 of the Bourbon County Rangers. But here's what happens when they are set to meet. Bondi will write, quote, On the last hills, overlooking the valley two miles wide, the pro-slavery camp was in full view, and the border county rangers and their border ruffian auxiliaries, outnumbering us five or six to one, immediately upon sighting us, galloped down the hill and turned and fled, leaving to our camp many horses, provisions, tents, and their red flag with the skull and crossbones. Some who had been enjoying a noon siesta left their clothes, their hats, their shoes, and their boots, end quote. On another occasion, Brown and his men will raid a mostly empty pro-slavery settlement. Bondi relates that they come across a pro-slavery woman who taunts them by saying, quote, no Yankee abolitionist can ever kiss a Missouri girl, end quote. Bondi, uh, this Jewish immigrant, will continue with his story, quote, As she uttered these words, I spied a litter of hound pups in the corner of the kitchen. I picked one up and said, I would kiss a hound pup before I would kiss a Missouri girl. And then I kissed the pup, end quote. I love that little bit of levity, but the following months in Kansas really represent the Civil War before the Civil War, and violence will rapidly escalate throughout the whole territory. Murders, gunfights, and lynchings become common. Homesteads are ransacked. Horses and livestock are stolen. Crops everywhere are burned. Travelers find bodies unidentified strewn all over the roads. Faced with this new surge of anti-slavery violence, the pro-slavery border ruffians vow to drive every free stater from the territory and burn every settlement to the ground. And they pick the border town of Osawatomie, where the Browns once lived, as the place to start. A force numbering 300 Missourians will cross the border. Brown at this point, however, will have a big problem. Nearly all of his sons have gotten sick, and they've left for the safety of Kansas, with the exception of the 
steadfastly and unflappably loyal Frederick, the one that I told you about with the long hair that essentially won the Battle of Blackjack for John Brown. When Brown hears about this looming raid on Osawatomie, he will ride to the town and prepare defenses, strategizing with the other free state military leaders, some of whom don't want Brown even there, and many of whom, most of whom, do not even want to fight this border ruffian force. The border ruffians will approach the town of Osawatomie, this crucial free state stronghold, on the morning of August 30th. Brown's son Frederick is out walking on the road when he sees the scouts approaching. Riding at their head is the Reverend Martin White, a pro-slavery Presbyterian minister whose home the Browns had attacked earlier that summer, stealing his horse and other property. Frederick approaches this column of scouts and will greet the Reverend White, saying, quote, Good morning. I know you. White replies, quote, I know you and we are foes. The Reverend then takes out his pistol and he shoots Frederick through the heart. Frederick will bleed out in the middle of the road. John Brown is having breakfast when he hears that his son, perhaps his bravest, the one that has stuck with him when all the others have gone to Nebraska, that this son is dead. Brown fights back tears, saddles up, and rallies his men to confront this pro-slavery militia. Brown, at this point, commands about 40 men. As I said, the pro-slavery forces number at least 300, so almost 10 times the number. Brown will take this little company of men and hide them off the side of the road, lining them up in the undergrowth behind trees and boulders. And as this pro-slavery border ruffian force marches along this road to the town of Osawatomie, Brown will give the order to fire, and the free staters unleash hell, raining bullets down on the pro-slavery ruffians. This ambush gets off to a great start, The ruffians are thrown from their horses. They try wheeling a cannon into position and fire it, but they miss badly. Brown will take a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he'll brush it off and keep fighting. After about 15 minutes of stalemate, the ruffian forces regroup and they mount a counterattack and charge into Brown's lines. Brown's men are forced to retreat and they flee into the woods. Several men scatter into the river behind where their line is to escape. One is killed. Several more are captured. Brown himself will run along the banks of the river, only crossing it when he's out of range of the ruffian rifles. With Brown's men dispersed, the ruffians then continue to march onto Osawatomie, which they then raise to the ground. They burn dozens of houses and businesses, and they plunder anything of value. They carry off horses and cattle. They take tons of prisoners, and they're looking for John Brown, trying to find him. But Brown has escaped. From the other side of this river... Brown is in fact watching the town of Osawatomie burn with tears in his eyes. He turns to his son, Jason, and says, quote, God sees it. I have only a short time left to live, only one death to die, and I will die fighting for this cause. There will be no more peace in this land until slavery is done for. I will give them something else to do than to extend slave territory. I will carry the war into Africa, end quote. Osawatomie is a disaster from the anti-slavery perspective, but it cements John Brown's legend. People in Kansas and nationally begin to see him as this man who stands up to an overwhelming force of Missourians, putting his life and the lives of his sons on the line. Henceforth, Brown will forever be known as Osawatomie Brown by his supporters and his enemies alike. Brown will reunite with his eldest son, John Jr., on September 10th, after John Jr. is released from prison, mentally and physically scarred from his imprisonment. And even though his family is so badly damaged, with one son dead and others sick and another mentally scarred for life, the story of the Civil War in Kansas, forced by John Brown's actions at Pottawatomie, will really miraculously change the whole question of this national conflict. By making this an actual fight, rather than a one-way slaughter, the national politics on the Kansas question begin to change. William E.B. Du Bois, in his History of Brown, will write about how these events cause an upsurge of sympathy for Brown and the anti-slavery settlers. Du Bois writes, quote, 
A great convention met at Buffalo, and mass meetings were held everywhere. Clothes, money, arms, and men began to pour out of the North. It was no longer a program of peaceful voting. It was a fight. For not only was there hell in Kansas, but the North was aflame. The very thing which John Brown had designed, end quote. Remember from episode two that President Franklin Pierce had so strongly resisted bending to the Topeka legislature and recognizing the free state settlements in his hopes of endlessly appeasing his Southern supporters. But the national scandal that results from the bloodshed in Kansas will make this position politically untenable. In 1856, the newly formed Republican Party will hold its first ever convention. And this year, in 1856, they will make one of their central electoral planks that Kansas, the territory of Kansas, must join the Union as a free state. And so to try to avoid this potential political tidal wave crashing down on the National Democrats in the election of 1856, President Franklin Pierce and his allies in Congress will make an enormous concession, which is that they will decide to recognize the legitimacy of the free state supporters in Kansas. Kansas's new territorial governor will push through a compromise that will restore true electoral integrity to the territory for the first time Remember how we talked about how even from the very first election, they were stolen by the border ruffians. Later that year, Democrats in Congress will send a final offer to Kansas that would allow it to join the union as a slave state. But with free and fair elections finally in place, Kansas voters reject the offer by an astounding margin of nearly 10 to 1. The vote effectively kills any hope from the slaveholders that Kansas will enter the union as a slave state. The Southern slaveholders in the Senate will try to delay as long as possible the question of admission because they know that with free elections in place, it is really just a matter of time before the entrance of Kansas as a free state occurs and they continue to lose by just a little bit their grip of the political power, the balance of power in Washington. And to go back to where we started with Potawatomi, what the great black writer W.E.B. Du Bois will say is that, and I love this quote, the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. And what Du Bois means with that quote is that the blood that John Brown spilled was not a good thing, but in Du Bois' mind was the necessary unavoidable price to pay to force the issue of slavery in Kansas. And after all these elections where the border ruffians had controlled the territorial government of this state to be. In 1861, Kansas remarkably enters the Union as a free state. Du Bois will write, quote, So Kansas was free. In vain did the sullen Senate in Washington fume and threaten and keep the young state knocking for admission. But the game had been played and lost and Kansas was free. Free because the slave barons played for an imperial stake in defiance of modern humanity and economic development. Free because strong men had suffered and fought. Above all, free because one man hated slavery and on a terrible night rode down with his sons among the shadows. Behind them lay five twisted red and mangled corpses. Behind them rose the stifled wailing of widows and little children. But before them rode a man, tall, dark, grim-faced, and awful. His hands were red, and his name was John Brown. Such was the cost of freedom. Thank you guys so, so, so much for joining us for episode three in our five-part series on Captain John Brown. As we said before, all five episodes in this series will be released to the public free of charge. But if you want exclusive early access to episode four, you can find it now on our Patreon page, Patreon slash American Carnage. We're just asking for three bucks. That would help us tremendously to keep the show going. We might do some bonus content, interviews with historians and the like. You could also help us decide what we do next here at American Carnage. We're sort of undecided what series we want to do after John Brown. So if you've enjoyed the series, you want early access to episode four, which will go over the crucial events at Harper's Ferry, head on over to patreon.com slash American Carnage. If not, no worries. Again, we'll be releasing all five episodes to the public free of charge. And um, thank you so much for listening and for your support. And we'll see you next time. John 
Brown's body lies a-moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a-moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a-moldering in the grave. His soul is marching on. The glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. He's gone to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's gone to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's gone to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. His soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on.